Hey, welcome back to Guard Beardia. Hopefully I sound a little better this time. Thanks to the community, I was able to buy some better recording gear. A lot less shit. I had no idea I was doing all this recording with a $20 condenser mic. Now I got a little more professional mic and hopefully I can sound better and so will the stories. This is part two two of whatever chapter this is and I got a bit of a headache so if I have to take a if I sound a little different because I had to walk away and do some things to my forehead <laughs> but here we go sorry for the wait the first unfortunates to fall under Yule's gaze were an entire company doing PT out near the parade ground. All of the troopers in separated platoon formations with their guide on bears out front. Each platoon's guidon had what looked like a personalized platoon banner and then a larger company banner underneath. Thanks to some vials of blood that Yethus had left on his desk, he had a fully powered translation amulet, but he could make out the names of platoons in their company. This one appeared to be the 8th Company Spittlejack's Reapers, and you'll assume the grizzled looking dwarf out front must be the one in charge of them. The dwarf, the one probably known as Spittlejack, bore the triple chevrons and rocker of a staff sergeant, with two basic sergeants behind him. One was a valley elf, and the other a large oni female. Spittlejack seemed to be some kind of retired monster hunter, as the dwarf seemed to be a mess of scars and wounds. He and his company were in their PT clothes, a simple shirt emblazoned with the veil rider crest and a pair of drawstring shorts. Judging from the dwarf's exposed flesh, his entire body must be a wound map of scars and close calls during his time as a hunter. The valley elf was clear of any wounds, had short brown hair, and a single long ear had been studded with a small hoop of gold, but he seemed to have mastered the NCO stare with his pearly blues. The only female was still a head taller than the valley elf, and her bulging muscles seemed to strain against every opening of her clothes. She appeared to be the blue skin variety, whatever that meant, and her white hair was put up in a thick laurel braid that ran around her head. Her eyes were dark yellow and didn't even glow in the morning sun, seeming to soak in the light and devour it. Yule could tell their eye colors because the two were staring at him as he strolled up the parade, his boots crunching on the ground as he headed towards the grassy patch they occupied. The Oni sergeant froze, mouth agape cutely, while the valley elf sergeant had to shake the morning cobwebs from his head, suddenly turning to the company before him. Company, attention, he barked, and all of the auxiliary troopers snapped to attention from their at ease, the guidon's banners cracking in the breeze from the sudden snatch of the pole. Spittlejack looked up in alarm, spinning around at his NCOs. What in the devil are you shouting for? Oh, bugger me, Mr. Yule! Spittlejack held out his huge dwarf hand, and Yule clasped it in his own. Just Yule will do. Going to do a little PT, are we? It is the time of day for it, Spittlejack said with a grin, and held out his arms to his platoons. If you like, you are more than welcome to take the reins. I assume you learned from my veil riders during your NCO training, right? Straight from the little book they brought. Excellent. Guidons, fall out and stack your banners behind the company, then fall into your respective platoons. With a whirl, all of the guidon bearers took a step back and then ran to the rear of the formed platoons, leading their banners together like they were rifles in the field. Usually, they never carried guidons to PT when Yule was in, but he suspected flags were a very special thing to the Vale folk when it came to their identity and self-pride. After all, they even made special flags for each platoon. When the bearers had fallen into the rear of the formations, Yule took a deep breath in and bellowed out, Extend to the left! March! All of the troopers began to yell as they all gained their arms wide space. With them a little more spread out, you could see this was a well mixed platoon, and even a few harpies were studded in among the ranks. As he called out the left face and extend once again, he had to admit, it felt good to be in a proper military presence again. A few of his more fastidious veil riders had brought a collection of manuals with them, and they had all been training auxiliary NCOs quite literally by the book. When all the troopers were spaced, he called them to the right and then barked for them to count off. As he listened, this was definitely a full company, and he looked around while the troopers counted out. 
All around him he could hear the same commands, and he had to wager he had at least a full battalion now, if not a brigade. Even numbers to the left, uncover. Now almost all of them could see him, and he could almost see all of them. He smiled broadly, taking off his uniform top to his bare shirt underneath, and rubbed his hands together gleefully. Ah, oh, well, we can stretch after this. It's been a while. The push-up! All of the troopers bellowed out the name of the exercise in return, and went to the ground when the command was given. Some trying to beat Yule since he gave the command well after he began to drop himself, and many ended up bouncing their chins off the grass. To his amusement, Yule saw the Oni, Sergeant Akagi, frowning as she did her push-ups, and surmised she must not have been a fan. The frown grew instantly when Yule called out the same exercise and led them in another set of two counts. Staff Sergeant Spittlejack seemed as game as Yule was, even doing them one-armed while jeering at his own troopers. Afterwards, doing their proper stretches and not just doing push-ups, Yule engaged in teaching them non-by-the-book exercises such as buddy squats, buddy drags, wheelbarrows, and water can strides. Sergeant Akagi couldn't help but burst out into laughter when Yule used her as a squat buddy, hefting her up in a fireman's carry and showing them the form. Then, to add inflection, he continued to walk about with the Oni on his shoulders, who had to hold her hand over her face to muffle her snorting giggles. There may be a time where you will have to lift your battle brother or sister from the field of combat. Dragging is not always an option. You may have to defend both of yourselves from the enemy. You can accomplish this by mastering the fireman carry, and these exercises will quit laughing, damn it. Yule reached up with his free hand and slapped Sergeant Akagi on the butt cheek, which just caused further laughter from Neoni and from almost all the troopers. Yule had to suppress his own laughter to continue. Push-ups and mountain climbers are good, but you will need to build up your chest, your leg, and your back muscles if you hope to get both of you to safety. I will show you how even that harpy there will be able to haul one of you louts to safety. Now find a dancing partner. The real training begins. The Oni was almost purple in the face from trying to hold in her laughter, and her white hair was coming out in strands over her cheeks. <laughs> Sir, please, I'm gonna die up here. Yule set her down and then shoved her off towards her troopers with a chuckle. The Oni giggling while Staff Sergeant Spittlejack and Sergeant Corton laughed at her. The Valley Elf currently laying over the dwarf's shoulders. By the end of the hour, he had mingled with plenty of the company and must have hauled half of them over his shoulders. For the last exercise, right before the final few minutes of PT, Yule challenged the NCOs of the company to a buddy race, even calling out the corporals for this one. When they all lined up, ready to half their partner and run to the point Yule pointed to, Yule himself scooped up a random male harpy private and took off at a dead sprint, catching all of them off guard. The harpy screeched in panic as Yule picked him up, and seemed to be praying to one of his gods in the hope Yule didn't fall over. Despite his obvious cheat, Yule was overtaken by a pair of quicker-thinking brim touch, and they took the victory in stride. Much laughter was shared, as well as many an auxiliary calling Yule a cheat, but it was all in good humor. Yule bid the company farewell, told them to remember his workouts, and then put on his uniform top after getting cooled down by a few spell slingers in the 2nd platoon. Checking the time on a spare cell phone he had in his packs, he saw it was near breakfast time, and he knew the perfect game to play with whoever was on headcount duty. Headcount was something of both a blessing and a curse, as while getting picked for it meant you got to skip PT, he had to literally count how many people came into the defect, or the dining facility, as well as take money for those who were not enlisted. The most nerve-wracking of the duties was to call the building to attention when a high rank stepped in to have breakfast. And it was here that most fuck-fuck games commenced. The line into the defect was quite long when Yule arrived in front of the huge building, and he judged from the smells coming from inside that actual cooks were toiling away, not some Joe who barely knew how to boil eggs correctly. In fact, it smelled damned good, and Yule was curious to see just how well his troopers were eating. He slotted into the line, stepping in behind a brim touch that was chatting up a relatively cute looking valley elf. Yule leaned in towards the two from behind and spoke in Tunka. What are they scooping up today? 
Beats me, friend. Yesterday they were serving something called a hash brown surprise that a Terran cook came up with. I hear those Terrans do love themselves some tubers. The brim touch turned around with a smile, ready to reply, but wilted when he saw Yule had leaned down and was eye to eye with him. Yule was almost six inches taller than this particular brim touched, and the valley of turned when he made a strangled noise at seeing Yule, the sun casting shadows over his face from behind. While the brim touch looked horrified, the valley elf seemed to have no idea who Yule was from how darkened his face was in the early rising sun. Yule saw she was a specialist, bearing the black shield and golden eagle on her shoulder, and she tilted her head as she observed his uniform. The brim touch stared on in horror as she looked at Yule, her hands on her hips. Hey, mister, where's your rank and name tape? Yule stage gasped and looked down at his shoulder, rustling the fabric with his fingertips. <gasps> Goodness, I think a harpy must have stolen it. The elven specialist actually took Yule by the elbow and began to turn him, pointing in the general direction of the larger supply building on the other side of the base. Well, you better go get your uniform in order before a Terran sees you. Imagine Commander Yule's face if he saw... you... With Yule now turned around and into the sun, his face lit up by the rays, the elven specialist now saw just who she was admonishing for their uniform. The brim touched was almost hyperventilating in panic, while the other auxiliaries around them were having to hide their faces behind their patrol caps, chuckling and laughing into the fabric. The elven specialist swallowed hard, her eyes almost tearing up in distress and embarrassment, and she very slowly took her hand away from Yule's elbow. In the shadows from Yule's patrol cap, she had thought that he had been one of the half-goliaths that are running around nowadays, and truly had just wanted him to be squared away. Ah, uh, good morning, Commander. Yule placed an arm around her shoulder, then the brim touched, and pulled them both to his sides. He gave them both a shake while smiling brightly. Good morning, breakfast buddies. If either of the troopers had been looking for a relaxed morning, they were not going to find it while the Terran commander had them gripped to his sides. Yule chatted to both of the sweating troopers, asking them what they had learned, what kind of training they were doing, and the like, while the line slowly churned forward into the building. The troopers around the little trio gave them a wide berth, and whispers were circulating around Yule as they all wondered why he was down here in the first place. After all, they expected him to dine in the command building. There was even a kitchen there just for Yule, Piper, and the seconds to Yule. The elven specialist quickly relaxed with Yule, but was still sweating just from the nerves of having him so close to her, while the brim touched Private First Class was about to melt out of his uniform. Eventually, they were in front of the doors, and Yule leaned in close to the two, hooking his arms around their heads and pulling them towards his. Why don't you let them know I'll be coming? Would only be fair. Both of them nodded vigorously, and he patted them both on the backs, sending them forward. While the elven specialist maintained an even stride, the brim touched skedaddled inside like a startled meerkat, and Yule could hear them telling the troopers on headcount what was awaiting them. Yule waited, looked behind him at the troopers waiting in line, and looked at the non-existent watch on his wrist. Everyone in view chuckled, as watches had caught on fast thanks to the Terrans, and now almost everyone that could afford them had one attached to their wrist from here to the high country. After waiting far longer than he should have, Yule stepped towards the door and peeked inside. He had his boots just barely against the threshold of the door and could see two very nervous looking valley elves staring back at him from behind a small desk. They both looked poised to stand up, their hands and elbows cocked on the desk to bolt upright and their eyes were staring at his boots. Their eyes flicked for a moment to Yule's face and they both brought their shoulders up higher when they saw the wolfish grin on his lips. Yule lifted his boot quickly and held it over the entryway, scant inches above the ground, and one of the Valley Elf privates let out a yelp, going to call the building to at ease, but then strangling the remark in his throat when he saw Yule hadn't actually taken a step inside the building. Yule had made it known he wanted nothing to do with the officer ranks, and his group of NCOs had built their entire training program around the NCO Corps, 
only using attention for company formations, and only if a very high-ranking NCO walked into their midst, like Yule had on Spittlejack's company. Yule saw from the small entry door to the dining room that a Terran was having breakfast, saw what Yule was doing, and sprinted off for some odd reason. Within moments, he returned with a few of Yule's seconds, all of them bearing Master Sergeant rockers and little golden stars glittering from the space within. Yule made a note to make fun of them later for even wearing the damn things, but he knew what they were getting ready to do. Blood was in the water, and the sharks were beginning to circle. Behind Yule, everyone was crowding around, trying to get a peek inside, and Yule lifted his boot away, the private breathing out a puff of air and sitting back down. Yule watched Cole round the entryway, his bowl of burr goo still in hand, and called out to the privates, who left from their chairs to at ease facing Cole. It was at that moment Yule stepped into the building, crossing the space between the door and the desk. Oh, so someone in this bitch outranks me then, eh? I can't wait to meet them. Both of the privates whirled around in horror, ears as high as they could go, and then the flank attack was launched by Yule's seconds, a small storm of blustering false rage that swept the two valley elves up in its gust. Oh, is that what we do now? Not call the building at ease for Yule? The noise was deafening as Yule stepped back and admired the little trick. The swarm of Terrans boiling around the two jammed up privates. Knife hands were inches from elegant elven noses as they bellowed, roar, barked, and growled in true NCO fashion. And Yule could have sworn he heard Donahue command one of the privates to stand on his head. He let it go on for a few more seconds before he himself issued an order to the group as a whole. That's enough. I don't think they have potions for heart attacks. The NCOs went from false red rage to laughing and joshing in an instant, shaking the now nervously smiling privates by the shoulders and telling them they were not in trouble. Those behind Yule were laughing all the way down the line, and Yule heard, halting his own laugh and spinning around, ripping his patrol cap from his head. Something you find funny, Boots! He roared, and barged out of the defect entryway, his NCOs instantly ticking up the war cry and exiting out with him. The two privates now got to enjoy this sudden turning of tables and took much pleasure in the schadenfreude. Outside, Yule howled. Half right, face, front leaning rest position, move! One, ah, 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 two, ah, 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 halfway down! As he belted out the orders, his flock of hawks circled and barked out nonsensical orders, commanding privates to sing Terran songs they knew not the lyrics of, or to calculate the flight speed of a laden swallow. One harpy in particular became panicked because she in fact was a swallow harpy, and had no idea what the hell a coconut was. The surprise attack was brief, and by the end, everyone was laughing or pretending to laugh to try and hide the stricken tears in their eyes from believing they were actually in trouble. Yule stepped back into the building, at which at ease was called properly, and then commanded his NCOs to finish their damn breakfast. The dining room was rife with chatter, which echoed out into the dish line. Behind the glass sneeze catchers, village cooks worked and told away at large stoves and pots, and Yule surmised that they must be getting paid to work up here. Almost all of them looked like mothers and grandmothers, working away while their children or grandchildren helped chop vegetables or dress meat. Every race was here as well, working together to feed the auxiliary troops. Yule bid them good morning, and they chatted him for picking on the poor troopers. One older valley elf waved a spoon at him, and he was curious just how old she was to have such little wrinkles. Even at her age, she would still be able to hold her own with younger Terran women. Why do you have to pick on those poor soldiers? They have enough to worry about as it is. Builds character, ma'am, Yule answered back, holding out his tray to a little brim-touched boy who slapped a few pancakes onto his plate. He quietly hoped that he was washing his hands often. She squinted an eye at him, then tucked a loose strand of dark brown hair behind her ear, having fallen out of her head wrap. Mm-hmm. And I bet no bacon will help you build character, too. A little valley of girl, who Yule seemed to be her daughter from the same dark brown hair and head wrap cloth, called out, No bacon! and snatched them off his plate as soon as she had dropped them onto it, reacting to her mother's whims. 
Yule placed his free hand on his hip, looking down at the little girl who stared back defiantly. What? Hey, I'm the commander of this place, you know. Mommy commands the kitchen. No bacon for Mr. Yule. Yule did his best to make her blink, but the little spitfire didn't even bat a lash. He looked from her to her grinning mother, while in the background the rest of the cook staff were chuckling. Fuse your NCO in this one. Fine. No bacon. I bet you put elf cooties on them anyway. Yule stuck his tongue out at the little elven child, who stuck hers out right back, before the both of them giggled. After that, he got a bowl of meat burr goo from a dwarven woman working a massive cauldron of the stuff, some scrambled eggs, and then a steak of some random smoked fish. It looked a lot like salmon, but it was purple and smelled like pork when he leaned down to sniff at it. With his laden tray, he walked out and picked his next victims. The dining area was a collection of long tables, lengthy enough that you could probably seat half a company at one if they all got friendly in the process. He saw that there was a space for him at a particularly packed table and he swept into it, nudging his elbow into a dwarf's shoulder. Hey, hand me that water pitcher, would you? The dwarf almost choked on his toast, but caught himself just in time, reaching over to grab the pitcher as well as a cup for Yule. Ah, thanks bud. Is there any hot sauce around here? Yule arranged his food in a logical order and decided to start with the pancakes and eggs so the burgoo could cool. Devil sauce over here, someone called, and a glass bottle was handed down towards Yule, who took it from his other seatmate, a male brush feathered private who for some reason smelled like lavender. Yule popped the metallic stopper off and poured it over his eggs, at which most around him recoiled. To Yule, it smelled like a standard pepper sauce, and when he popped a spoonful of eggs into his mouth, found it to be quite mild. Judging from the looks others were giving him, it may as well have been molten lead he was tossing into his mouth. What? Yule asked, chewing his eggs as he poured himself a glass of lemon water. Commander, how do you humans just eat that stuff like it's nothing? An elf needed to be dragged to the medicos after he mistook it for tomato sauce once and stopped breathing. Yule shrugged and cut into his pancakes. On Terra, army food is usually almost edible, and the hot sauce helps not only flavor it, but kill bacteria on it. He poured a little on his burgoo as well and gave it a little stir before tasting it. A female brim touch stared at Yule, confused, her spoon scraping up the last of her own burgoo. You use it to sanitize your food? More or less. What do you even eat over there, then? Yule looked up. Thinking back to the ingredients of the MREs he had eaten, whatever had come out of the kitchens on the bases he had been stationed on, as well as having to run down and kill a rabbit with his boot just to have something with actual meat for a meal. Everything, really. Jeez. She muttered, before spooning the last of her breakfast into her mouth. Yule continued his line of questioning here as well, feeling out how things were going on base. Despite trying to find fault, everything seemed to be rather positive all the way around, except that Chick Lee was playing pranks on people, and Cole was collecting small animals in his NCO's cottage, some of which tended to hoot loudly at night. Besides that, every Vale folk he talked to were excited for all the new changes, telling Yule that this was the escape from their basic lives of farming or crafting. The possibility of going into battle alongside Yule and the Terrans fighting against the Fae, and taking back lands from the Chosen Children were a key point in all of them, and Yule did his best to keep his face upbeat. After all, the volunteer platoons he took to the field thought the same, and barely any of them made it back to Valhalla Hill. It was good that their morale was up though, and he let them tell him about where they came from, about their old jobs, and what they thought about the crazy stuff that Gremlin kept telling them about. All of them were excited to see such things as the television, or hold one of the prized communication devices that were favored by the Terrans themselves. To the Vale folk, the Terrans were the key to unlocking the ability to jump forward hundreds of years technologically, and they were thirsty for the independence that the tech brought with. Yule was skeptical. He knew what the internet could do to people, and he was pretty sure the people of this realm weren't ready for that kind of mental and spiritual warfare. Then again, he noticed that there were daily comic and joke drawings near the front of the defect, a rudimentary message board if one would. Perhaps, maybe he could discuss the idea with Gremlin, as he himself had no idea how the internet actually worked, let alone circuit boards for computers. 
When it came to that wheelhouse of knowledge, Yule knew he would barely be qualified to shovel coal into the boilers. Thankfully, plenty of his veil riders knew the science behind it, and just maybe that could bring this rail sprinting into modern communications like a runner being chased by a grizzly bear. Due to all the talking, his meal had gotten slightly cold, and he finished up quickly in true army fashion. When Yule went to deposit his dishes and tray at the wash station, there were curious creatures bustling around the place, and he couldn't help but lean in to look at them. Who in the hell are you lot? Dozens of faces whirled around to stare at Yule, and he really had to take a moment to take them in. They reminded Yule of elves, but as if they'd been crossed with some kind of fish or amphibian. Their skin was ever so lightly blue and green and seemed to be wet from how shiny it was. Their eyes were wide, the iris of which were slits but slanted in towards their nose. Their ears reminded him of a gremlin from the movies, but after they had gotten wet and went around town setting things on fire and fighting bikers. Despite the comparison, they were still awfully cute and were around the same height as a standard sparrow harpy. Their hair was almost all white, with only a few seeming to fall into the gray range and the color kept to their eyebrows as well. Their fingers, curiously, were webbed and were thickly muscled as if they were used to dig deep into the mud while swimming or something. The one standing in front of him tapped his fingers on the edge of a bin. Mr. Yule, you place plate in bin. Yule looked down at him and slowly placed his dishes in the bin, looking the creature up and down. Seriously, what are you guys? We are the Yamatu! A voice piped up from the rear. From how the pitch was, it must have been female. The Yamatu, are you guys water types or something? The whole dish crew shared a small spout of chittering laughter before the male in front of Yule began handing off his dishes to the Yamatu standing next to him. Yamatu are water elves. We take care of rivers and bays. We build our homes in the banks and cliffs. We need moisture. We handle wet work on Valhalla Hill. Good to have you here, Yule said unsure, and kept staring at the Yamatu's teeth as they were really throwing him off his game. Almost all of the Veil folk had long canines, or at least normal teeth like humans, but the Yamatu had very flat, fine teeth, as if they were used for crushing things instead of biting through flesh. Kinda curious, what do you folk eat? Shellfish, mostly. Red meat hurts tummies. Hmm. Noted. Yule turned away from the Yamatu dish crew and began to walk away, but kept having to look over his shoulder. When he did, they would all wave, and he would wave back. It was something about their gremlin ears that really made him uneasy, despite how adorable they may look on the outside. Years of childhood training had taught any Terran that something with those kinds of ears should never be in water, and the damn things apparently lived in it. Judging from how the females were built, they seemed to reproduce naturally, so at least he didn't have to worry about them popping out of each other's backs or something of that regard and swarming his base. With the sleeper cell of Yamatu behind him and breakfast happily rumbling around in his belly, Yule decided to pay a visit to the prisoner he had left behind the few weeks before. If his hunch was right, they were using some kind of weird tracing spell on him or his units in some way, and any chance of breaking her compatriots was done in by her slitting all their throats. You remembered that someone had mentioned she kept trying to escape, and was curious to see how she's being held to keep that from happening. As he walked down the paths that scrolled around Valhalla Hill, he began to get hard Vietnam vibes from the buildings around him, as well as the troopers who walked around in their OD green uniforms. If he were to start blasting some door gunner tunes, have a few Hueys fly over his head, and scatter some beer cans around, he was sure the scene would fall perfectly into an old war movie from his youth. The only thing that broke the illusion were the fantasy races running around, and the twang of magic being casted for jump-starting a fire or cooling down hot machinery. Much like the barracks buildings, command, and the bathhouse, the detention center was crafted by whatever had come through to build them all. Difference was, this building had a lot more metal in it, and all the windows had bars. Like any detention center, it held a skeleton guard. A few troopers who just had to make sure the prisoners wouldn't die of thirst or dig out of their cells like demented prairie dogs. One of the guards leapt to his feet, knocking over his chair. Eddie! As you were. Where's the elf woman? 
The guard blew out his air-filled lungs, no longer needing it for the command, and his buddy pointed to the first cell, just behind them both. She's in that cell, Commander. Yule nodded and walked past them, both of the troopers forming up on either side of his flanks. When he came before the cell, the woman inside was much different than the one he had left behind. The cell itself was quaint. There was a wash basin with only one inlet, more than likely just cold water, a flushing toilet, and a rough wooden bed, at which a single straw-filled mattress sat. In the middle of the wooden floor, Faditha sat, her long, high-angled ears glowing with reddened runes. More than just her ears, her entire body seemed to be covered in the runic lettering, and you could tell more from smell than sight that that was blood. When the runes flared, blue runes on the bars of her cell door and window would buzz up as if they were bug zappers, giving off a soft crack as they caught whatever was sent off from her. While her runes were elvish, the ones on the bars were dwarvish. Yule smiled cruelly and squatted down. Shame your alphabet is shit in comparison to the dwarves, hmm? Faditha's brows came together and her eyelids slowly opened. Her seething, rage-filled eyes met his own, and they stared into each other. She detested Yule, not for what he stood for, but purely for what he was, a human. He hated her not for what she stood for, but for what she was, a fae. Her hands did not move from her knees, contorted in a mantric pose, held in place from her trying to cast her failed spell. Before she spoke, her left ear gave a twitch, and her left eyebrow ticked. Still alive? A shame. Since you were prettier before you left. Yule ran a finger down his scar, his face contorting. Yes. Even at your best, y'all can only mar my flesh and ruin my sleep. More the shame for that town, and all your people I killed within it. What town? Miserium? That should have been your grave, along with the filth that followed you into battle. You leaned forward, going down on a knee and resting his arms on his thigh. His hunch had been correct. This little half-faced shit had been broadcasting magically to her fellows until the dwarves put up those bars. That could only mean those greasy pricks knew where Valhalla Hill was, and he had another hunch that those Bradleys would more than likely be beelining here, which meant they would hit Domino first. Am alone. We survived Mysterium. Faditha squinted an eye before grinning widely and burying her fangs at Yule. Bollocks. There's no way you could have survived the artillery. You wouldn't even be able to sneak into Emma. Errolith's skull crunched like an egg when I stabbed into it. I was surprised to see that Fae shit themselves when they died. The grin on her lips slid away into a snarl, her nose wrinkling and her eyebrows coming down on her eyes. He could see the anger boiling the magic behind her irises. You lie. You're no match for Erelith. Yule slid the knife out of his pocket, still covered in the gore from his killings, and her nostrils flared, scenting the magical blood on the blade. I plunged this into him, right up through his mouth and into his brain. He died like the stupid little turd that he was, and I left him to rot in the sun. Her eyes flashed, and Yule saw her knuckles go white, clenching in their pose. The muscles running along her arms flexed as she strained to not react to Yule, trying to not give him the fury that he wanted. Yule continued, turning the blade over in the light, and even the troopers next to him had to look away from it. I plan on adding more of your disgusting fey blood to this knife. By the time I'm finished with your petulant race, this blade will be shining gold. This was enough. Fadithus launched herself from her sitting position and slammed into the bars, the entire frame rattling from the impact, blue sparks arcing and dancing into the air from her hands. Those same motes of light reflected and sparkled in her eyes as she stared across at Yule from her knees. Pressing her face against the space between the bars as if trying to push her own skull through them just to get to Yule. You fucking rust blood. We controlled your squalling race for hundreds of generations and twisted you to our own desires. How dare you kill your betters! She was almost foaming at the mouth, reaching through the bars and trying to grab at Yule's face. 
Yule, without even an ounce of emotion, whirled his knife through the air and stabbed it through her hand, pinning it to the wooden floor. She screeched in anguish as the thick blade rent through her palm, the pressure agony against her hand bones. The fury, the wrath, however, did not leave her face, and she sucked air in and out through her bared teeth, eyes still locked on Yule's. Yule leaned in, his face inches from hers, and he began to slowly twist the knife. As she let out a silent scream, breathing out hoarsely from the roaring pain in her hand, he reached through and grabbed the side of her face, bringing her hard against the bars by the ear. You slaughtered my troopers and their enemy like they were nothing to you, as if they were but toys to your machinations. Not only did you dishonor my auxiliaries, you dishonored their enemy, and this I cannot abide. Yule wrenched the blade the other direction and began to drag it across the wooden floor. Infidithus broke, mewling, her mouth open in silent torture. You fey are abhorrent. Even you little half-breeds are equally repugnant. When I get done with you people, you will be nothing but a horrible stain on the histories of two worlds. Fadithus puffed out her cheeks and squinted her eyes open, staring up into Yule's. She had one last jab, one last low blow to make sure Yule didn't walk away from their duel completely in victory. She grinned horribly, despite the pain, and steadied her voice. Just as you are history, to your wife and daughter. To punctuate her insult, she pursed her lips and blew Yule a kiss. In response, Yule shot his other hand forward and began to strangle her. Fadithas had to admit she didn't see that coming and thought her insult perhaps better sent when she wasn't already in his clutches. Yule had her heart around the throat with both hands and she coughed hard, her hands scratching and clutching at his fingers. Both of the troopers had leapt into action, pulling back hard on Yule, one of them even wrapping his arms around Yule's neck and pushing against the bars with his boots. But Yule's grip was fueled by old, bitter pain. Fadithus was beginning to make frightened, gurgling noises as she fought for air, trying to force it into her lungs past Yule's iron grip, her face slowly turning darker shades of red. Both of the troopers were straining hard against Yule's arms, and the one not wrapped around him ran to the front, trying to work his fingers into Yule's to try and loosen his grip. Yule, let her go, Yule. You're better than this, sir. Yule watched Fadithus' eyes begin to empty of her anger, and instead fill with fear. The same look he had seen so many other times. The same look that Southern Elf outside him alone had when Yule held his hand as he died. The fear of knowing death would soon be drawing down upon them. Their last few seconds of reality would soon be impressed by the void. He felt the anger draw from his heart as he remembered that dead Southern Elf boy, and he loosened his grip a hair. And Fadetha stopped shaking in a strain. The trooper that wrapped around him spoke hushedly into his ear, and Yul could hear the near panic warbling in his voice. Sir, she's our prisoner. Please stop. You don't have to do this. It's not right. I know she said that horrible thing, but you don't have to do this. Yul could do it. A few more seconds of gold flecked blood not going into her brain, and she would be dead. A sack of flesh to be discarded. Horribly, the slight loosening of his grip allowed some air to get into her lungs, and she gasped harshly before speaking, her voice strained. Please! Don't! Yule's face contorted, his breath short and rapid, before he finally threw her away, her form bouncing off the wooden floor. Her hand was still pinned to the ground, but in terms of pain, that was a far memory. Her lungs heaved, and Fadithus choked down gulps of air in between sobs. She had never come that close to dying before, and she was not a big fan of the experience. Yule's face was still warped in seething hatred, but his troopers finally exhaled, breathing sighs of relief. Good, sir. Good. Let that stuff just settle. Yule stared down at Fadithus's form, her back heaving as she forced air into her lungs, and he growled ripping the knife out of the ground and out of her hand. She drew her wounded hand back and clutched it to her chest and began to openly weep, curling into a ball. Yule stood, spat down at his feet, and turned to leave the building, stepping slowly. Send a healer for her hand. Give her wine. Give her hot water.
and for Dethus. He heard the elf twist her head around on the wooden floorboards, and he paused in his step. Fuck you. He heard nothing in return, and he did not desire an answer, walking out of the detention center and back out into the sunlight. And that's the end of this chapter of the Veil Riders series. My head is fucking pounding, but we got it. We got through it, just for you guys. If you like this story, and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, as well as click the bell icon so you know the videos are released through the week. If you really, really, really like the story, there's a coffee you can donate to to help keep the ball rolling, because Bedlam's got bills and I'm the one who pays her. <laughs> But I hope you guys are enjoying the story. Hope you guys are enjoying what I'm putting out. I'm sorry it's taking so long, but we're getting we're getting to more thicker chapters. There's more writing to do. I'm trying to make sure the stories aren't like, you know, shit. So it takes a little more time. But yeah, hope you're enjoying it. And hopefully you're here next time for the next chapter to listen to it and enjoy the story. So until we see you next time on this side of the veil, this is Garbro. This is also the Bell Dam, and this has been Garbeardia.